5 and place your bookmark. Galatians 5 and place your bookmark. where we'll be for our lesson. We'll leave it a few times, but we will come back to it. This coming Saturday and Sunday, Brother Doy Moyer will be with us. That's not a typo. His name is Doy. Doy, not Don. Doy Moyer. Does a fine job this Saturday and Sunday. Make sure you've got that written down. He'll do some really, really good lessons. So we appreciate you guys already in advance being there for that. And if you're visiting with us, we'll be glad to have you as well. Uh, take note of Sunday evening will be 4 p.m. instead of 5 p.m., our normal meeting time. But this Saturday and Sunday, Brother Doy Moyer will be here. He'll do excellent, excellent work. Be sure you're here for that. And then tonight, we're going to talk about how's the Bible arranged. This is part of the series of lessons we're working on this month and once in August and a couple in September. Hope that will be a benefit to you. But tonight at 5 p.m., how's the Bible arranged? Appreciate so much everyone being here. We do have many visitors. We, we are glad that you're with us today. Hopefully what you find in our worship so far is stuff that is in accordance with the Word of God. That's what we're aiming to do here is glorify God, follow His Word. If we can help you in some way, if you have questions about what we do or why we do it, we'd be glad to sit down and visit with you about some of these things. But we appreciate so much you being here this morning. Kyle, excellent song selection and song Song worship, appreciate the men on the table, Landy and John Tom. Appreciate Andre reading the scripture for us and, and always appreciate Mark's prayers. When I grow up, I want to pray like Mark Banks. I appreciate him and his work, not just as a shepherd, but as a man who prays for us in our assembly. Always, always benefit from listening to those. Sundays are the best day of the week. And what we've been doing this morning is exactly why that is the case. Appreciate you being here. Galatians 5, verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working by love. Faith working by love. When I was doing some reading for this lesson, thinking over material I had in my my computer, I searched what motivates you and came across a picture from my youngest daughter's kindergarten class material. One of the questions the teacher sent home, wanting to get to know my child before the first day of school was, what motivates your child? And in the comment section, I wrote absolutely nothing. Good luck. School's fixing to start back. Thursday's my girl's first day back. We're going to have to start wrestling with some of those things again. What motivates your children to do their schoolwork? What motivates your children to do their schoolwork and still get chores done? What motivates them when things get busy and things get hectic and things get difficult and challenging? What motivates them? Well, maybe a better direction to take with this is not so much how we motivate them to do schoolwork or motivate them to do their chores, what motivates you to serve King Jesus? God asks us to do some hard things sometimes. I, I, I will confess, you younger kids may be disappointed to hear, but God asks you to do things that are sometimes more difficult than homework and more difficult than chores around the house. God asks you to change your life. God asks you to be holy as He is holy. God asks you to not go places like other people might go or wear things like other people might wear or say things like other people might say. God asks you to be different than the world around you and that is sometimes a very challenging order. So when the going gets tough and when life gets difficult and these challenging things start imposing themselves on you and the way you want to live, what motivates you to dig in and do what is right. I do think there is some relatability in this topic and in parenting. Perhaps what motivates your child is a little bit of fear. You get your work done. You get your grades up. The homework better be finished. 
or you will get your rear busted. Maybe it's depriving them of something. In our world today, it's take away the phone or change the Wi-Fi password. Maybe it's the hope of a reward. You get your grades up, you do your schoolwork, and you do your chores, and you will get to do this. You'll get to have that. All of those things are fine in some ways, and all of those things are fine in sometimes incremental ways, but perhaps there's an element we're missing. If those are the only ways we motivate our children, we're missing a key component to the discussion. If those are the only ways we can be motivated to serve our God is a reward or the fear of punishment, perhaps we're missing a fundamental component to our service to God. You can jump on Amazon and read book after book after book after book on subjects regarding motivation. But I want us to dig very deeply into this subject this morning. And I want us to challenge the way we serve God. And I want to challenge the why behind we serve God and the way we serve God. I'm going to ask it now. And I want you to think, what motivates you? Well, let's look at three different subjects, three different possible ways we could be motivated. I think the one that jumps out, maybe the first, the one that comes to mind almost immediately, is God's justice. Look over in 2 Corinthians 5, please. 2 Corinthians 5. Some of these texts will be very well known to you. Many of us probably can quote them, and I will make the assumption that most of the Bible students in this room can quote this verse, but sometimes it benefits us to read it and to think about what it actually says. 2 Corinthians 5 Notice verse 10. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. Paul says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in his body according to what he has done, whether it is good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your conscience." There is no way we can dodge this subject. There is a place called hell. That is the reality of our life here, that one day we could end up there. But there's also the reality of heaven. And so we are left with only two options, two destination places, one being heaven, one being hell. And it is up to us and the way we live and whether or not we serve God, determining on which one we go to. I do not want to water that down. I do not want to discount that. It is a good motivator. I can still remember when I was a young man, maybe I should say a boy, when I was a boy, one of the chief motivators behind me responding to the gospel invitation was the fact that I knew Jesus was the answer and without Jesus, I was going to go to hell. That's a good motivator. There's nothing wrong with that. But if that's all that's motivating us, we're missing a key component. We will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We will appear before Him and we will answer for the way we have lived our lives. We will give an account of our souls to God. Romans 14 makes the same observation and Hebrews 9 verse 27 makes the same point. After death, there is the judgment. That's a reality, folks. But sometimes, fear of punishment is not enough. Now, now, that's not to say that's the case for everybody. I have, I have two children, and you could not pick two kids who are more opposite. One child, I can just say, I'm disappointed, and she melts. The other child, I say, go get the belt, and she says, no. <laughs> it's not quite that bad. But, but we get that. There's nothing wrong with being motivated by fear, but I'm afraid sometimes, haha, that if fear alone is what motivates us, the temptation will be to do just enough to try and avoid hell. Just enough, and so we are poorly motivated. If fear drives you, it is almost inevitable that you will end up making wrong conclusions about subjects. Very important subjects, mind you. 
it is almost inevitable that you will end up asking the wrong questions. Questions like, is it just enough? It, it might be a good motivator to keep us from really big stuff. The life-altering sins. But it may not be enough to keep us from what we sometimes call the little things. Uh, go to Galatians 5. We asked you to mark that just a moment ago. I want you to read a text just later in that chapter. Galatians 5, verse 19. Galatians 5, verse 19, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contention, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelry, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I have told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now I want you to think about that list. If fear is the only thing keeping you trying to be faithful to God, how many things on this list would you actually be okay to engage in? Oh, I, I know we wouldn't want to do the adultery stuff. That's life-altering. But sometimes it's not the fear of answering God that keeps us from doing these things. It's fear of facing the consequences of the action. You see, you go out and commit adultery, it's going to cost you your, ma your, your marriage. And it's going to cost you your family. And it's going to cost you time with your children. It's going to cost you a lot of money. It's going to cost you a whole lot of things you can't anticipate. Is that the fear that keeps us from doing it? Or is it the possibility of answering God for doing it? You look at the list. All the big stuff. And I'm saying that tongue in cheek. The big stuff we won't do out of fear. But look at verse 20. Hatred. You ever hated somebody? Does the fear of God keep you from hating somebody? Not if you hate them enough. Jealousy. Outburst of wrath. Selfish ambition. You know, we don't really talk about selfish ambition enough, do we? You look at our culture, that is the mindset that, that our culture wants everybody to have. We, we want you to be a little selfish, and if you don't think that's the case, go look at social media for 32 and a half seconds. Social media is a selfish venture. That's what it is. It's look at me. It's look at what I'm doing. It's look at my life. It's look at my things. It's look at the stuff I've just bought. It's look at how I spend my time. It's look at my vacation. It's better than yours. It's all about selfish things. You see, fearing God may keep us from the big stuff, the things that would really ruin our lives, but it might not keep us from what we would classify as the little things. It won't help us to be truly sinless and holy as God would have us to be, folks. Fear by itself is not a good motivator. And you don't have to turn there. I just I want you to listen to this text. It's a text you would actually know really, really well. But there's a, a specific line in it that resonates with me in this topic. Listen to this very carefully. You believe there is one God. You do well. The demons also believe, and listen for this, and tremble. You think fear alone is a good motivator? Not by itself. Did you understand what I The demons tremble before God. The demons are afraid of answering to God, but does it prompt them to serve Him? No. That's exactly James' point in James 2.19. It is not enough to serve God faithfully, to be holy as we should be holy, to glorify Him as we ought to. I want you to think about this in very relatable terms with parenting. It's okay to instill what dad can do to you is cause pain. That's okay at a certain age, at a certain point. You need to listen to dad because if you don't, I have the power to jerk you off your seat and bust your tail. But if that's the only facet of your relationship... If that's the only way you ever motivate your children, what will they eventually do? I'm going to tell you. They will rebel. They will resent you. And they will eventually want nothing to do with you. Guys, fear. Fear is a great motivator. But if it is only fear that motivates you to serve God... 
you will never serve him as you should. Number two, perhaps it's the hope of reward. Go to Hebrews, please. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews, the 10th chapter. And I want you to notice this phrase in verse 23. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. The Hebrew writer says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Now, I want us to think, what is he really talking about? The the confession of our hope. Well, my friends, if you're thinking about the way hope is used in the New Testament, then very quickly you begin to realize this is hope for a fully realized relationship with God Almighty. It's being in His holy presence for all eternity. Sometimes we say heaven. It's because that's what heaven is. Heaven is the unending, unalterable relationship with God where, where He is there and I am there. There's nothing between us anymore. Go read some of the pictures in Revelation. The throne seen especially in 4 and 5. Go read the later chapters of Revelation where the great sea is no longer before the throne of God. Folks, that's what we're talking about. Being with God. Hope to go to heaven is a great motivator. But it can't be the only thing that motivates you. It can't be the only thing that drives you. Because if all we're after is hope and all we're after is heaven, we'll miss some key components here. We'll we'll attempt to do just enough to get to heaven. And so that's where we'll start asking, what is enough? It's the do I have to questions. Do I really have to get baptized? Do I really have to be faithful? Do I really have to attend services? Do I really have to dress that way? Do I really have to not say those things? You see the problem? If hope to be with God is all that's driving you, you'll start asking the wrong question. What is just enough to get by? That's all I want. I just want to skirt through this life and just just barely make the cut to heaven. See, hope is a great thing, folks, but... But if that's by itself, we'll be tempted to cut corners. And what we'll end up offering is a very selfish service. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. But if all you are trying to get out of serving King Jesus is to one day go to heaven and get all the stuff God's promised to you, what you're doing is a very selfish thing. It's a selfish service. I just serve God because He promised to give me good things. It's selfish. We ought to be after so much more than just what God has promised to us. Just the hope of good things in this life is over. Hope is great, but but hope doesn't always keep us afloat when things get very, very difficult. Hope is a great motivator, but but, but at the same time, if what we have in, in our current sight is more tempting than the future promise of heaven, what what are we going to choose? It is the old thing, son, you can have one cup of ice cream now, but if you'll be patient, if you'll wait, I'll give you a whole bucket of ice cream this afternoon. Which is the kid going to choose? Oh, I really hope to have the big bucket, but the little ice cream scoop, it's in front of me right now. Hope is a great tool, but hope can be lost. Hope can be far-reaching. It can be shaken. It can be tossed aside. Flip over one chapter in Hebrews to chapter 11. Look at verse 32 and follow. We won't read the whole section. It's one of my all-time favorite sections of Scripture. But listen to this very carefully. By faith, verse 32 of Hebrews 11, by faith, he's discussing these individuals who went through great things. So he says, what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and also of David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Now now my friends, think about that. Imagine living in any one of those circumstances and all you have is hope. If that's all that motivates you, how is that going to help you against a lion? 
How, that's, how is that going to help you when you're facing the edge of the sword? I, I don't mean to diminish what hope is. It is a wonderfully powerful ally. Even earlier in Hebrews chapter 6, in verse 19, a text you probably know very well, the Hebrew writer says that this hope, Hebrews 6, 19, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters into that which is behind the curtain, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. He says the anchor of our soul is this hope. It is sure and steadfast. I don't want to dis- diminish that. I don't want to discount that. But ships can lose anchors in storms. If all that drives you is hope for what Jesus provides, hope for what Jesus offers, what happens when you want something here and now more than you want Jesus later? You see? Hope is a great tool. But when we want what is here and now more than what we want there and then, hope will not be enough. Perhaps you can promise the things to your children. Ice cream later is a great tool. But they would rather have many times what's happening right now in front of them. I know a child, I won't say a name. I know a child that was promised a bicycle if they came home with no more bad marks from a teacher. That did not work. Because... Making a promise to a child in April and telling them get through April and get through May is like telling a child to wait till you're 175. It's a great motivator. but Sometimes that hope is not realized for so long that we can't tangibly hang on to it to get us through the hard times now. Maybe we should look a little bit deeper then. Go back to Galatians 5, if you've had that bookmarked. I hope you have. Listen to the text again. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working, here it is, by love. What motivates you to serve King Jesus? My friends, this is the great motivator. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Why did God do that? It wasn't just because of the hope of a heaven with His people. It was part of it. It wasn't just because His wrath was going to be dispensed upon all the ungodly creatures He had made who had rebelled against Him. It wasn't just those things. It was because God so loved the world. That's a degree of love. Not a trivial aspect of love. A so loved What God wanted was His people. What God wanted was people who responded to Him and would become His children. But it was all out of love. Because God so loved. In 1 John 5, in 1 John 5, you'll see some of this same stuff. 1 John 5 and verse 1. Listen for the key word here. 1 John 5 verse 1, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves Him, who begot also loves Him, who is begotten of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. Why are God's commands not burdensome to us? It's not because we hope for heaven. It's not because we're afraid of God's wrath. It's because we love God. Because we love His begotten Son. Folks, isn't this the motivation behind parenting? Now, I want you to think as your children went through their adolescent years. Maybe you started by motivating them with a little bit of fear. Sweetheart, you better get it done or you're going to be grounded. You better get it done or you're going to put your nose in the corner. You better get it done or you're going to get your rear busted. But what did it progress to? When they began to, to understand things in a greater way, 
You do this, I will get you something nice. You do this, you can have an hour on TV. You do this, you will get something as a reward. But where do you want it to eventually go? Sweetheart, I want you to listen to me because I love you and you should love me. Isn't that where we want our children to understand? We, we want our children to get to that place. This is why we take care of them when, we, when they get older. It's not because they're giving us something. It's not because they can jerk you up and bust your ear anymore. I'm pretty sure I could take my mom. Don't know if I'd want to try. So it's certainly not out of fear of my mother. It's not just because of what my mom might could do for me. There's very little she can do for me at 32 years old. But why would I want to help her? Why would I want to do what she asked me to do? Because I'm, I'm old enough now, I'm mature enough now, I'm wise enough now to look back on what that woman has sacrificed for me. I'm old enough to see, to grasp how she sacrificed for the things that I needed. How she wanted to make my life better, though it didn't even seem like it at the time. And how do I respond with that? I respond in love because I want to serve her. I want to help her. Folks, this is in some degree the way it works in marriage. Why, why do you respect your husband? Why do you love your wife? Why do you try to serve each other and meet those needs? It's not because you're afraid of your husband. Please, for the love of God, not, that not be the case. It's not because your husband says, well, you do this, sweetheart, and I'll buy you a new ring. No. That can't be what motivates. It's got to be that bond, that love. I've chosen to be bound to you for the rest of my life, and what I want to do is help you be better, and I want to help you do more, and I want to help you serve God better. This is the way we want all of our relationships to be to some degree. Does anybody want a friend around who just is there because you give them stuff? Surely not. But instead, if what we're doing is seeing that love and that sacrifice and that humility and that service and, and reciprocating those things, you see, then we have something that's tangible. Then we have something that, that really is a good tool for motivation. Even Jesus would make an observation very similar to this in Matthew 22 when he is asked, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Remember what Jesus says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself on these two commandments. Hangs all the law and the prophets. Folks, the quote Jesus offers goes back to Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5. This is always what God wanted. You see, the way you do things matters. That's what God's book says. The way you do things matters. He cares about what you offer Him. It better be something He has authorized. But just as important is why you offer it. Wasn't that what the Jews missed in the Old Testament, folks? Sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. But what was missing? The love for God. The love to be right with God. The love to be pleasing in God's sight. See, love is the great motivator. Faith working by love. See, fear and hope, they can be a great spark to ignite it. But it cannot be the fuel for your faith. If you were to poll the adults in this room, I imagine that many of us would tell the other that I was baptized for the remission of my sins because I was terrified of going to hell. There's nothing wrong with that as a motivator in the beginning. But as you mature and develop and grow and process this information, what you learn is God loved me when I was way more sinful than I ever thought I was. And God made salvation a reality for me, though I am truly unworthy. And what you do is you reciprocate that love. What God asks of me is very little in comparison to what God gave me. God gave His only begotten Son. And what God asks of me is to give my life sacrificially to Him.
This is why, if you want to think about 1 John 5, verses 2 and 3, what God asks us to do is very, very doable. Because what we want more than anything is to love Him. Because He has loved us. How do we be faithful? How do we remain faithful? How do we stay excited after you become a Christian? It is not unheard of for a person who obeys the gospel to just have a passion for serving the Lord. And as they get older, that passion tends to waver. Sometimes it's not even when you get older, it's just a few months after the newness of it all wears off. So how do we maintain that level of zeal and passion, that fervor for serving the Lord? How do we overcome the plateau? How do we fix the mentality that says, how little do I have to do to get by? How do we stay motivated? Faith working by love. It is the same thing we hope for our children. And... Of course, that makes sense because God is our Father in heaven. What does God, the Father, want from His children? He wants you to grow up. He wants you to mature and to develop. And with each passing year, grow a deeper appreciation for who He is and what He's done. That, that with each passing day, we love Him more fully, more completely than we did the day before. That I was a sinner destined for an eternity in hell. And what God did was love me in my unlovable state and offer His Son that I could have hope of a reward. That I could have saving from that judgment, that eternal hellfire. And he did it all because he loves me. I hope these things will help you in your walk with God. Perhaps what you need is the initial motivation. There's nothing wrong with being afraid of hell. There's nothing wrong with wanting heaven. And maybe that's where you're at this morning. You've not experienced the love of God, have not responded to the love of God, reciprocated that love. By repenting of your sins, confessing that Jesus is the Christ, and being baptized for the remission of your sins, you can have that love of God fully experienced and realized, and you can be waiting for the hope of reward, and you can be free of that wrath of God. If you have a need of this congregation this morning, we'd invite you to make it known now as we stand and as we sing.